Hey, and we, we obviously have this course because it's so very, very important that we keep this message clear. I'm, I'm assuming that in the work of the Lord, you're going to constantly be talking to people about knowing Christ as Savior. You men will be preaching to people about knowing Christ as Savior. You'll be teaching from your own children on into the folks you minister to in church. So getting this clear is so very, very important. But that's not the only reason. What motivates us to keep serving the Lord no matter what? Why do we serve the Lord when circumstances get really bad? Because Christ died for us. Why do we serve the Lord when our, our best friends have disappointed us? Because Christ died for us. Why do we serve the Lord when things go bad at the church? Because Christ died for us. Why do we keep serving the Lord when we have failed and we're mad at ourselves and discouraged with ourselves? Because Christ died for us. So yes, a major reason for this course is that we be able to discuss all these different aspects of the gospel clearly, but also that we never forget. Christ died for us. Some days in the ministry you will really enjoy. Some days you won't. So which days should you serve the Lord? All of them. Because Christ died for us. Some days, you, you may be confronted with information that Christians that you looked to and loved and respected failed. And you're discouraged. Should you quit serving the Lord on that day? Absolutely not. Why not? Christ died for you, and he never failed. You all got it? This is about keeping a clear gospel message to a world that desperately needs it, desperately needs it clearly, but it is also about <clears throat> keeping us on track. On the days that other people fail me, I'm still saved because Christ died for me. On the days that I fail and I'm disgusted with myself, I'm still saved. Because Christ died for me. The days when I wonder, does all this matter? Turns out it does. Because Christ died for me. And in one of the most amazing things for me, eh, you all have grown up with the internet and Facebook and all that. I go from way back before we had any such conception. I remember the first time somebody about 12 years ago was explaining Facebook to me. I had no idea what it was. Well, you all have grown up with it. But Facebook's been an amazing thing because as a result of it, I've had communications from all kinds of people that I had not seen for many years or heard from for many years. You see, I wonder what happens, and, and look you up. And along the way, and in moments, when the Lord knows I really needed it, I hear from somebody that I had a part in them finding Christ 20 years ago and then lost track of them. And, and they'll look me up on Facebook to say thank you. That's a pretty good reason to go on for tomorrow. Wonder what, what might happen tomorrow if I keep serving the Lord faithfully tomorrow. We want to stay focused on serving the Lord. Well, we're looking at all these aspects of salvation. Study three, salvation seen as justification. And it very, very interests me, the Lutheran church was founded on justification by faith. It got away, it's, it's founded in the 1500s. It got away from salvation by faith in a lot of their churches hundreds of years ago. Yet amazingly, some of the Lutheran churches still keep the old Lutheran doctrinal statements 
even if they don't believe them. And this is what, from the official confession of the Lutheran church about justification. I wish this is what they really preached today, but they got it right then. Listen to this. Poor sinful man is justified before God that is absolved and declared free and exempt from all his sins from the sentence of well-deserved condemnation adopted into sonship and heirship of eternal life without any merit or worth of our own also without any preceding present or any subsequent works out of pure grace because of the sole merit complete obedience bitter suffering death and resurrection of our Lord Christ alone whose obedience is reckoned to us for righteousness. Hallelujah. J. Vernon McGee, one of the most prominent Bible commentators of our era, wrote this. I, uh, I treasure McGee's commentaries. If I'm preaching on a passage, I'm looking it up in at least three commentaries. Matthew Henry, which was the 1600s, and David Sorensen, who's still living and a close friend of mine, both Matthew Henry wrote commentary in the whole Bible. So David Sorensen wrote commentary in the whole Bible. J. Vernon McGee wrote commentary in the whole Bible. J. Vernon McGee, I think, passed away about 20 years ago. But uh, I did hear him speak live on several occasions. He wrote this. There's always been the danger of adding to or subtracting from Christ. The oldest heresy is also the newest heresy, by the way. It is all about Christ. If there's something in your gospel that does not give all the credit and glory to Christ, you have gotten something wrong. I am not saved because of anything that I have done. I am saved because Christ died for me. I have not saved for any sin I have avoided. There are some sins I've never committed. Would joke with somebody that I've never drank one drop of alcohol, ever. I'm 70. I've gotten to 70 without taking the first drink. I think I'm going to make it the rest of the way. I really do. Don't mean to be overconfident, but I think I'm going to get the rest of the way without ever drinking. But I'm not going to heaven because I've never drank. I'm going to heaven because Christ died for me. Harold Wilmington on justification. The definition of justification, first of all, what it is not. It does not mean to be acquitted, that is to successfully defend oneself against all charges. It does mean to be acquitted, it's a legal term, but it doesn't mean to say I proved myself innocent. It means I'm found innocent, not because I proved myself innocent. And we know that all things, whoever the law saith, it saith to them, we're under the law. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay? The charge is that I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. I have no defense. There's no excuse. I have nothing to offer. It does not mean to be pardoned. That is to be found guilty, but given a second chance. We are pardoned, but that is not what justification means. It does not mean to be paroled, that is to be guilty and set free with certain restrictions. Positive considerations, what it is. The great theologian H. Strong has defined justification the following way. By justification, we mean that judicial act of God or on account of Christ, to whom the sinner is united by faith. He declares that sin is no longer exposed to the penalty of the law, but restored to his favor. Justification is thus the legal act, it's a legal word. Is the legal act whereby a man's status before God is changed for the good. If you were to look up the name Phil Stringer in the records of heaven, you would find the record says, I have never sinned. That may not be the record here on this earth. But if you look up the record in heaven, it says, I have never sinned sinned. That's justification. I was preaching on this not too long ago and I looked out and there was a friend from my high school years. We were teenagers together. We weren't the worst teenagers you ever heard of, but we were teenagers. 
And I said, you know, his, his name is Mike. And I said, if, if Mike was to look in the records of heaven and look me up, it would say, Phil never sinned. He might find that funny. He has a better memory than that. But I said, I doubt if he'll say anything. Because I have a memory too. <laughs> and we were teenagers together. And we might not want every detail of our teenage years told to everyone from this pulpit. But if I was to look it up in heaven, it would say Mike never sinned. Because we have been justified. Glory to God. The need for justification. His epistle to the Romans, the Apostle Paul presents sinful man in a courtroom on trial for his very life. The charge is high treason against the king of the universe. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The presiding judge is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and hath raised him from the dead. The jury is made up of the law of God and the deeds of man, who will render it every man according to his deeds. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. As many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. After a proper deliberation, a just and fair verdict of guilty is returned. A terrifying sentence is then imposed. Spiritual death, meaning to be forever separated from God throughout all the eternity in the lake of fire for the wages of sin is death. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In light of all this, we readily seen that a desperate need for justification existed. The miracle of justification. Up to this point, the case of God against man has pretty well followed the format of earthly jurisprudence. But suddenly something totally different and unexpected takes place that would surely cause every earthly court reporter to gasp in utter amazement. The judge has carefully heard all the evidence and patiently listed to all the pleas. He finds no other choice but to invoke the supreme penalty, lest true justice be denied. Before the terrible sentence can be carried out, the same judge quietly closes the case book, lays down the heavenly gavel, rises to his feet, takes off his judicial robes, and goes out to die for these convicted defendants goes out to die for these convicted defendants. This and this alone is justification. You want to know why I'm justified? My sin has been paid for. You know how much of it I paid for? Absolutely nothing. And yet, my sin has been paid for. I have the promise of God that my sin has been paid for. How's that for a reason to serve him? I don't have much to offer compared to what he did for me. But what I do have, Jesus died for me. The corrupt, doomed, and naked sinner may not be cleansed, delivered, and clothed, uh, may not be cleansed, delivered, and clothed in the very righteous of Christ himself, stayed yet another way, an earthly judge might approach a guilty defendant in one of three possible ways. He could condemn the man and thus fulfill the demands of justice. He could compromise with the man and thus frustrate the demands of justice. He could seek to somehow clear the man. The divine judge, of course, chose the third approach, namely clearly clearing the guilty defendant through justification. The method of justification. How then can a man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Job 25, 4. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be of grace. Romans 4, 16. 
One of the great Old Testament examples of salvation can be found in Numbers 21 and referred to in John 3. At that time, many sinning Israelites had suffered fatal wounds by poisonous snakes. But God offered a cure, requiring only that by faith the stricken victim gaze upon a brass serpent atop a pole. The event is reported by Moses. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. The event recalled by Jesus. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It is by grace, being justified freely by his grace, to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified by his grace. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's say anywhere that we're justified by repenting of all our sins, justified by being baptized, justified by joining the right church, justified by living in victory all the time. Just, we're justified by his grace. Man justifies only the innocent, but God only the guilty. Man justifies on the basis of self-merit, but God on the basis of the Savior's merit. Two great examples of justification. Abraham, he was justified apart from circumcision, and he believed in the Lord and lived in absolute victory. All right. Did Abraham live in absolute victory? Abraham made a couple of pretty big mistakes. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. We informed he was 86 at the time of his conversion and Abraham was four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. We were told he was 99 when circumcision took place. He was nine years old and nine when he was circumcised the flesh of his foreskin. Imagine a contradiction between Paul and James concerning justification of Abraham. That him that worketh is reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Why am I counted as righteous? Why does the record in heaven say, Phil Stringer never sinned? Because I believed on him that justifies the ungodly. Think I have a reason to serve him? A reason to dedicate everything to him? And then, but James says, you see how by works a man is justified, not by faith only. James is talking about being justified before men. We have a whole lecture on this that will come up on Thursday. The teaching of the Reformation was good works make not a good man, but a good man maketh good works. David, he was justified apart from the Levitical offerings. Blessed is he whose transgression, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. When does God have David write that? After he has sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah. Why is sin not imputed to David in the court of heaven? Was it because David never sinned? I think we're pretty comfortable. Adultery and murder qualifies as sin. Even if you want to try and divide sins into big ones and little ones, which I don't, but if you wanted to, you think those would both count as big ones? Why is iniquity not imputed to his account? Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. My sin is covered. What covers my sin? Blood of Jesus Christ. 
For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Aren't you glad that the record in heaven, I didn't say on earth, I didn't say you won't have to deal with your sins on earth, but the record in heaven is that you have never sinned. Say, but what, what, if, what if my life has been marred by, by horrible mistakes and sin and ungodliness before or after salvation? How can I go on? How can I serve the Lord now? How can I have any confidence? You want know what your record looks like in heaven? You have never sinned. I did not say there are not consequences of sin in this life. You rebel against the Lord. You got to get drunk. You're driving a car drunk. You get in an accident. And in that accident, you lose your arm. You're heartbroken over your sin. You get right with the Lord. Will God go on and bless you and use you? The answer is yes. How many arms will you have? One. You can live with the consequences of your sin here on earth. But in a record of heaven, I have never sinned. Results of justification. Okay? The remission of sin's penalty. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe and repent and are baptized and go to church and live in victory all the time are justified from all things. What does it say? By him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Have remission of sin's penalty. Have the restoration to divine favor. You have the imputation of Christ's righteousness. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. That was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. It wasn't just written so that we'd know that Abraham's sin was imputed. Christ's righteousness was imputed to Abraham. But it wasn't just written so we'd know that about Abraham. It was written so that we'd know that about us. See, do I have a reason to be grateful to the Lord today? See, has the Lord made me a millionaire today? Pretty sure he hasn't. Do I have the strength and vigor of youth today? I can guarantee you I do not. Has everything happened in my life in ministry the way I wanted it to? It has not. Has everybody that I ever trusted kept that trust? I promise you they have not. So why should I be faithful and dedicated to the Lord today? Is the Lord in heaven counting my sin against me? In the record book of heaven, I have never sinned. How's that for something to be grateful for? When you understand that, you understand how people go on serving the Lord in the midst of toil and trial and trouble on this earth because they have not forgotten what Christ did for them. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> Then I'm going to go, and I'm going to quote here, as I do several times in these notes, from Dr. Harry Carr. I don't know anywhere that the notes from Dr. Carr are available. I, I mentioned Louis Bray Schaefer. I mentioned um, Harold Wilmington often in here and others. And, and you could go on the Internet and find their material. 
Dr. Carr may have been the greatest Bible college professor or Bible teacher I ever knew. But his material is not out there. By the grace of God, I have a copy. I've been with the Lord several years. He and I were precious friends. I probably admired him as a Bible teacher in Bible college settings more than any man I ever knew. And um, I'm glad to be able to at least be put some of his material in front of people. And we're going to quote from him often in here. I'll quote from him now on justification. Justification is an important consideration to each of us. Whenever we fail, we seek to make an excuse that makes us look better to others and feel better about ourselves. First example is came in Eden. After Adam and Eve sinned, they made an attempt to cover their sin by making a garment of fig leaves. The idea was to make things as they used to be and ought to be. Adam further sought justification by using his wife as an excuse for his failure. Not to be outdone, Eve blamed the serpent for her failure. Everybody says, not my fault. It's the woman you gave me. It's the devil. Not my fault. Boy, that is man's sin nature. Thousands of years later, we still seek justification by attempting to fix blame anywhere except upon ourselves. Our acts, words, conduct, failure, and sinfulness are the cause, are the failure of our environment, the society in which we're forced to live, the amount of our income, the failure of our parents, the educational system, or just the neighbor next door. We certainly don't believe we're responsible for our sin or our failure. In fact, considering all the things that have happened to us, we think we've turned out pretty well. And we, we blame our culture for our sin. Some sins in the United States that are just so often accepted are cultural, and people act like American culture is more important than what the Bible says. Same mistake gets made in the Philippines, oh, not necessarily with the same sins. I'm answerable to the word of God. Okay. My culture is not an excuse for my sin. Okay. However, in spite of my sin, I am justified because in the record of heaven, it says Phil Stringer's never sinned. He didn't say it says that in the record of earth. In the record of heaven, says Phil Stringer, has never sinned. Yeah. Millions of dollars are paid to psychologists to help people feel less guilty about their conduct. Each new generation has invented an entirely new code of social norms and ethics in an attempt to feel less guilty about their failing morality. We've become proficient in our excuses and we invoke them whenever needed. We use them to cover the little stumble in a crowded mall. What is the reason for our failure in meeting expectations? Whether those expectations are those established by ourselves, by others, or by God. Self-justification is a thin, transparent veneer that fools no one except ourselves. Justification defined. Justification is a judicial term. It is the translation of the Greek word diako which means to acquit, vindicate, or to pronounce righteous. Justification is an act of God whereby he declares those who've been saved by the blood of Jesus acquitted from the divine verdict of guilty, having imputed to them the righteousness of Christ. A simplistic definition of justification is given just as though I had never sinned. However, this is not a completely accurate definition, since it can be misunderstood. Justification is not a reckoned as a return to our original pre-fall state, but the be, but to be in Christ. But to be in Christ. It is his righteousness on display and not ours. Do you know why the Lord looks at my record and sees no sin? He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not my record on display. The declaration of justification does not make a person righteous. 
They must be made righteous by salvation prior to the announcement. How justification made possible. Bildad, a friend of Joab, made many theological errors in his talks to Job. But he did raise a very important question. How then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Bildad asked the right question, even though he didn't know the right answer. The absolute righteousness of God is held in stark contrast to the sinfulness of man. Mankind is guilty, and condemnation is passed upon the human race. Isaiah 64, 6. We are all as unclean thing, and all our unrighteousness are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Or Romans 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Or Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Man has no excuse for his sin, need none can be found. There is no means whereby he may justify his thoughts, his action, or his nature. This caused Micah to raise a question. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He's saying, can I pay for my sin if I offered thousands of animals to sacrifice? Could I pay for my sin with 10,000 rivers of oil as a sacrifice? Could I pay for my sin if I offered my firstborn? And the answer is I couldn't. But my sin's paid for anyway. <laughs> but not by anything I offered. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not, says Ecclesiastes 7.20. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Condemnation is not a future pronouncement against unregenerated mankind. It's the ever-present standing judgment on all those outside of Christ. The wrath, righteous judgment of God must come to all unregenerated mankind. This wrath is held in store to be revealed in the last days. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men hold the truth and righteousness. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart Treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The great day of wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? We've earned the wrath of God with our sin. The wrath of God will be realized in its fullest extent at the judgment of the great white throne. Or by those names who are not found written in the book of life will be cast in the lake of fire. In order to justify man, God must do three things. First, he must settle the sin debt against man. Secondly, he must cleanse the sinner. Thirdly, he must impute righteousness. Since the wages of sin is death and hell, and no man was capable of satisfying the debt for himself, much less for another, a substitute must be found. The sacrifices of the Old Testament are mere types. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. None of those sacrifices paid for man's sin or provided salvation. A, a false teaching that is spread a great deal. I know it's widespread in the United States. It's widespread here in the Philippines. Is the idea that the, God had a different plan of salvation for a different era, every different era. And that during the Old Testament law, that our sin was paid for by the blood of bulls and goats. That is not true. The blood of bulls and goats never paid for our sin in any era. The blood of bulls and goats was a picture that the blood of the Messiah would pay for our sin. And it's very, very important to grasp this. It's in Romans 4 in, in real detail. I'll come along and say, well, there's a plan of salvation for this dispensation, plan of salvation for this dispensation, plan of salvation for this dispensation. And in their independent Baptist folks that teach this, they mean well. I have friends that teach it. They're wrong. Romans chapter 4 tells us, compares the salvation of Abraham, David, and ourselves. Abraham was saved before the Old Testament law. 
You know how Abraham got saved? He believed God and it was counted him righteousness. David was saved under the Old Testament law. You know how David got saved? He believed God and his sin was not imputed to him. And you know how we get saved? We put our faith and trust in what Christ did on the cross of Calvary and we're justified. Abraham and David and I and you all got saved exactly the same way. David did not get saved by the blood of bulls and goats. Blood of bulls and goats was a picture God chose in that time to picture the fact the blood of the Messiah would pay for our sin. Today, there is a picture that says the blood of Christ paid for my sin. It's what we call the Lord's Supper. There's a picture that says the death of Christ and burial of Christ provided the gift of my salvation. It's called baptism. But the blood of bulls and goats never saved. Baptism never saved. What Jesus Christ did on the cross of Christ saves us. Hallelujah. We'll take our break and look forward to a long but fruitful day tomorrow.